Hello, everyone. So I'm Davide Taibi from Tampere University, and uh, I am welcome to chair this session on software measurement and uh, coding practices. So the session is divided in uh, two slots. So we have the first session uh, from 2.20 to three, 5 past 3, and then the second session, the second slot, uh, in, uh, from 3.15 up to 3.45. In the first session, we are having uh, uh, three full papers, and uh, now I would like to give the stage to Luigi Davazza, presenting the paper uh, on uh, simplified functional size measures for effort estimation. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I will present the result of uh, this piece of research that I carried out with Zheng Liu and uh, Roberto Meli. Uh, specifically, I will present the result of an empirical study aiming at evaluating if extremely simplified measures of the functional size of software can be used to estimate uh, development effort. Uh, uh, functional size measures uh, uh, of software are the input required by many effort estimation methods. Therefore, they are widely used. Now, performing the standard measurement uh, requires that the standard measurement process defined by the International Function Point User Group is followed. Uh, however, performing this standard process involves uh, some time and cost, uh, which in uh, some conditions uh, is considered excessive by uh, project managers. Uh, also, functional measures uh, could be needed before functional requirements have been elicited completely and at the required detail level. Uh, that is, uh, current conditions may prevent the application of the standard process. Uh, several simplified processes have been uh, proposed to get estimates of function points in order in a shorter time and uh, at a fraction of the cost required by the standard process. Uh, in this paper, in, instead of estimating function points, uh, we explore the possibility of using uh, a different simple measure uh, to support effort estimation. The proposed measure is so simple that quick and cheap measurement is guaranteed guaranteed uh, by definition. Uh, however, before adopting such measure, we need to know if uh, it supports effort estimation with a level of accuracy that is not substantially worse with respect to estimates based on standard function points. Uh, to this end, we performed an empirical study that I will uh, illustrate uh, now. Um, before proceeding with the presentation, uh, let us have a look at the definition of function points. Uh, the diagram uh, in this slide shows the elements that have to be identified and counted to get the uh, standard uh, if hook function point uh, uh, measure. Uh, I will not go into uh, details here. Uh, you can find details on the paper, which also contains a reference to the standard uh, if hook function point. Um, uh, counting measure, uh, counting manual. Um, here uh, we can see uh, the subset of uh, the uh, software specifications that uh, we consider to get a simple measure of the functional size. Uh, in practice, we propose to simply count uh, transactions. Um, in other words, uh, we will verify if most of the details, uh, so the uh, logical files, uh, the uh, classification of transactions into input, outputs, and queries, and so on, uh, are actually necessary uh, to uh, get uh, a good uh, effort estimation. Uh, we can note that uh, some simplified measurement processes have already been proposed uh, considering only uh, logical data files and the number of transactions. Uh, we are going a step further by ignoring data and accounting only for the functionality that uh, is presented to the end user. Uh, concerning the um, empirical uh, study, uh, we used the data provided by the ISBESG, uh, that is the International Software Benchmarking uh, Standards Group. Uh, the study consisted in uh, uh, deriving a statistical model of effort based on standard function point and a similar model based on the number of transactions. Then we compared the estimation accuracy provided by the two models. Uh, since effort estimation is the main reason why function points are used, we assume that if the number of transactions work fine 
for f of stage deviation, then uh, it can be uh, considered as a candidate to replace uh, standard function points. Um, in detail, we used uh, a version of the data set that was released in 2015 uh, because afterwards the ISBEG stopped collecting fine grained data, including the number of transactions. So that was the most recent data uh, available. Uh, we selected only highest quality data from the data set, as is commonly done when using uh, ISBEG data. Um, the, uh, so as already mentioned, uh, we looked for models that estimate effort based on size. Uh, and the ISBES dataset contains data that concern new development projects as well as enhancement projects. And since these two types of projects are known to have different characteristics, uh, we derived uh, different models for new development projects and enhancement projects. Uh, in addition, we considered a specific sub subset of enhancements uh, that is, those enhancements that uh, do not involve changing or deleting any existing functionality. In practice, these are proper extensions. Uh, okay, we built uh, our models uh, using uh, ordinary uh, least uh, squares regression uh, after log log transformation, as was done by many authors like Barry Beam and uh, others. Uh, we found statistically significant models only for new development projects and extensions project, but not for uh, general enhancement uh, projects. Uh, the models found are those uh, shown uh, here. Um, we then proceeded to uh, evaluate this model's accuracy, and to this end, we performed uh, uh, 10 times a tenfold cross validation. And these are uh, the first uh, results. These box plots represent the distribution of effort estimation errors for models based on standard size measures and uh, models based on the number of transactions when applied to uh, new development projects. Uh, on the left hand side, we have the complete distributions, while on the right hand side, we uh, excluded the uh, outliers. And uh, it is easy to see that the distributions are very, very similar. Similar. Uh, here we have uh, the uh, distributions of absolute errors and the uh, orange diamonds, so uh, here for instance, uh, represent the mean absolute errors. And again, uh, in the right hand side, uh, we have uh, the representation without outliers and these two horizontal lines represent the uh, baseline models. And uh, uh, we can see that our models are uh, better, at least uh, as far as the mean is concerned, than uh, the reference models, so they are uh, acceptable. Um, and as in the previous slide, the uh, distributions are very, very similar. Uh, here we go to uh, extensions uh, projects. And again, we have the box plots of errors. And we can note that, uh, uh, again, the distributions are very similar. And finally, we have the uh, absolute errors for uh, extension projects. Um, OK. Um, uh, finally, uh, here uh, I reported the uh, values of the uh, uh, mean uh, absolute uh, errors, and uh, uh, we can see that uh, uh, we can see that. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, we can see that uh, here the difference uh, between uh, the errors provided when using size and when using the number of transactions are very small. In practice, here we have a 2% difference. And here we have that uh, using transactions, the error is even uh, less than uh, when using uh, uh, proper uh, standard uh, size. Um, uh, now, even though the box plots and the uh, absolute uh, means uh, give a quite convincing evidence that the two considered types of models provide uh, very similar uh, performances, we proceeded to, to compute the effect size using uh, a few uh, different statistical tests. And all of them confirmed that the effect size is close to nil. 
which means that uh, there seems to be no uh, difference uh, if we use uh, uh, the number of transactions instead of the, uh, the functional size, the standard functional size. And uh, uh, okay, so in conclusion, uh, the results of the study uh, suggest that in general, uh, it may not be necessary to go through a relatively long and expensive process to get uh, standard if book measures. On the contrary, simply counting the number of transactions as defined in the if book accounting manual uh, supports effort estimation without uh, an appreciable loss of uh, accuracy. Uh, so uh, the conclusion for practitioners is that uh, if they have uh, uh, suitable uh, historical data, they can try the proposed models and verify in practice uh, our hypothesis that the number of transactions is a good uh, predictor of uh, effort. Um, uh, we must observe uh, anyway that uh, we tested only models of effort that use size as the unique uh, independent variable. And since it is uh, well known that effort depends also on several other factors, uh, additional research is necessary to evaluate the performance of uh, effort models based on the number of transactions in combination with uh, other factors. Uh, we did not do this uh, in this research because we did uh, not have uh, the, the, the suitable data. Um, so in the future, we will try to generalize our results by looking for data containing uh, measures of factors that together with size affect the development or maintenance effort and building and evaluating if the number of transactions is a good predictor of effort also in combination with such factors. And uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention and uh, uh, I'm ready to answer questions. Thanks for your presentation, Luigi. So uh, I do have some questions. Uh, first of all, how do you compare uh, the accuracy of those uh, simplified function points with IFPAG or COSMIC? Do you think uh, they are comparable from this point of view? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, um, uh, first of all, the, the, the very practical uh, answer. Uh, in order to do such comparison, uh, we would need uh, data concerning projects that have been measured both with uh, functional, uh, with, with function points and with uh, cosmic. And there are practically no such data. So uh, the, 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 the empirical um, uh, evaluation of this hypothesis uh, at the moment uh, seems to be uh, practically impossible. Uh, in theory, in theory, uh, well, we have that uh, uh, cosmic function points require a similar, um, similar um, information as uh, function points do. Uh, and in fact, there are, uh, as well as uh, for uh, function points, there are uh, simplified uh, cosmic uh, uh, measures or uh, uh, um, methods to estimate uh, cosmic uh, function points uh, based on uh, uh, less uh, information. Uh, so uh, in principle, uh, counting the uh, number of transactions uh, uh, which in terms of uh, uh, cosmic function points means uh, counting the number of uh, functional processes may provide the same kind of uh, benefits. But this is uh, uh, um, a type of research that uh, is, is uh, surely a, a good topic for, for future activities. Thank you. Uh, so we do have a question for, uh, from uh, YouTube. So can the software characteristics impact the results presented? For example, software with many database accesses, uh, embedded software, or so on? Uh, well, uh, in general, um, the ISBES data, so the data we use, the, uh, come, come from, a very, from a very large number of organizations. So they are um, very different uh, with respect to uh, type of projects, uh, uh, type of processes, uh, um, ability of uh, the people involved uh, and the tools used and whatever. So there is a huge uh, variability in the, uh, in the data we used. And uh, uh, 
so uh, the, the, the characteristics mentioned uh, are for sure one of uh, these uh, uh, variation factors that can uh, absolutely affect the uh, the effort. So, uh, well, if you have data that uh, concern projects characterized by by these uh, by these uh, um, characteristics, uh, such as uh, database access, embedded software, and so on, uh, well, <laughs> I am ready to uh, cooperate to apply the the, the considered the, the the proposed method and see if uh, uh, this fact these factors in combination with the number of transactions uh, are helpful for, get, uh, for getting uh, um, uh, more accurate uh, effort estimations. Yes, and the last question from uh, the audience, from Marcos Kalinowski. Uh, so could you summarize the potential implication of your findings to effort estimation practice and uh, should organizations replace function points with a transaction counting approach? Uh, well, the, um, the consequences are uh, quite straightforward. Uh, counting, uh, as, I, as I show uh, here, you know, counting uh, the number of transactions means uh, um, uh, focusing on a, a very small fraction of the specification. So you need uh, very little to get uh, the uh, measure and support uh, um, effort estimation. Uh, anyway, I would be uh, quite Quite prudent uh, before adopting this uh, uh, this uh, uh, measure. Uh, if you have uh, historical data, uh, you can simulate uh, what uh, uh, models based on uh, the number of transactions uh, would provide uh, as uh, effort estimates, and then uh, decide, uh, look at the uh, accuracy of, of this uh, of these uh, uh, effort estimates exactly as we did, and uh, uh, and then take your decision. Okay. Thank you. Thank in, you general, uh, in general, my idea is that uh, uh, all these kind of details uh, are less important than uh, uh, the other characteristics, uh, such as uh, uh, the complexity of the application, the maturity of the development process, and so on and so on. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the answers and thanks a lot Thank for your you. presentation. Uh, now I would like to give the stage to the next presenter. So we are, I'd like to introduce uh, Martin Guaric from the University of Stuttgart, Germany, that is going to present a paper on an empirical validation of cognitive complexity as a measure for soft source code understandability. So we are going to hear something new compared to the old fashioned uh, cyclomatic complexity. Right. Thank you for having me. Um, I prepared an animated video presentation for you um, that I will now play. And afterwards, I'm here and happy to answer all your questions. So enjoy the video. What you see here is a function called primes, which selects from a handful of numbers those which are prime numbers. And when you have a look at this code, you might say, yeah, this looks pretty easy to understand. Now, this might be just one function in your large code base, and you would like to know if there are any other functions in your code which are a bit harder to understand. As developers, we spend a lot of time on understanding source code, so the optimizations here and there would certainly be a good idea to save some time in the future. And this is where metrics come into play. A metric that calculates the understandability of our example here could come to the conclusion, easy to understand. This video is about such a metric. It's called cognitive complexity, has been developed only three years ago, and claims to measure source code understandability. Instead of easy to understand, the metric calculates a number, three in this case. In very simple terms, every time there is a for loop or an if statement or other interruptions in the linear control flow, a counter is incremented. So plus one for this for loop here, and plus one for this if statement over there. At the same time, the increment depends on the nesting level. Our if statement is within the for loop. This is why we increment here by two instead of one. Intuitively, this makes sense. The more we break out of the linear flow and the deeper we nest our code, the more cognitive load one would expect and the more difficult the code is to understand. Now, the issue is that in this case, it is the same as with most metrics reported by code analysis tools today. They have not been validated yet. In other words, many metrics claim to measure specific quality attributes, but have never been shown to do so. This is why we took cognitive complexity as a metric and did some research. 
Will this be the first validated metric that can automatically measure code understandability? Let's find it out. An empirical validation of cognitive complexity as a measure of source code understandability. That's the title of our paper, which was recently accepted at a conference called Empirical Software Engineering and Measurement. Empirical Software Engineering is a very exciting field in which a lot of different research is published. What these studies have in common is that they aim to better understand software engineering by collecting and analyzing data. In this work, we have collected data to validate whether the cognitive complexity metric actually reflects how well developers can understand source code. An obvious study design would be to invite, for example, 50 people and watch them understand some code snippets. But then we would have ended up with exactly that, 50 people and information on a handful of code snippets. Would that be enough data to say something about how well the metric works? Probably not. So instead, we went looking for the data sets of existing studies on code comprehension. Let me give you an example. There's this study called Shorter Identifiers Take Longer to Comprehend. It's a nice study. They told 72 participants to find a defect in a code snippet and measured the time it took them to find the defect. Spoiler alert, the result is that shorter identifiers take longer to comprehend. While this is a cool result, we were more interested in the data set of the study because this would tell us for the investigated code snippets of this study how well developers understood them. Now you might already see where this is going. Taking this data, we could calculate the cognitive complexity value for each code snippet ourselves and see if it correlates with the measured understanding. For example, for code snippet A, it took participants in this study 76 seconds on average to understand the snippet, and the cognitive complexity of the snippet is A5. Snippet B took them almost two minutes to understand, and the cognitive complexity might be a 10. And we can find out how well the metric and the understanding measurements go together by calculating a correlation coefficient. At this point, we calculated exactly one correlation value that indicates how well the metric works on the data set of this one study. And now let me tell you that this is not the only study on code comprehension out there, so we went to find them all in a systematic literature search. We described the literature search in great detail in our paper, and I've linked the paper in the video description. What we basically did was to search for all studies that measured the understandability of code snippets as part of their study with human participants. Starting with 7,000 initial search results, we ended up with 56 papers that met our inclusion criteria. Of these, slightly less than half had published not only their paper, but also their dataset. And finally, of these datasets, 10 were of a format that allowed us to work with them. So we had a total of 10 datasets in the end to work with. Speaking in numbers, we ended up with a total of 427 code snippets with about 24,000 evaluations. Enough data to investigate whether these evaluations correlate with the cognitive complexity metric and definitely more than we would have obtained ourselves in a single study. Before I present the results, two things are important. First, the construct of code understandability is measured in several different ways. Some studies measure the time it takes developers to understand the code snippets. Others measure the correctness of answers to comprehension questions, and still others simply let developers give their subjective rating of the code understandability. So far, we don't know how these measures are related, and therefore reported the results grouped by each measure. We will shortly see what this means. Second, the actual analysis method can be summarized as meta-analysis using the random effects model. This sounds complicated, but can be explained in very simple terms using the concrete results. Here we go. These nine studies here measured the time it took participants to understand specific code snippets. Right in the column next to it, we see the number of code snippets that were evaluated in each study. This has a small influence on the weighting of the respective study for the final result. For each study, we calculated a correlation coefficient. This coefficient indicates how well the values of the cognitive complexity metric correlate with the measured times took developers to understand code. The correlation value is always in the range from minus one to one. In this case, we expect a positive correlation because if the code is difficult to understand according to the metric, then we expect that developers also need more time to understand the code. 
Accordingly, each correlation value created in zero supports the assumption that the metric works well. Now, look at this. We already see a clear tendency towards positive values here. The nine correlation coefficients are then combined into a single value using the random effects model. This is basically a weighted mean of the nine correlation coefficients, which is more meaningful than any single correlation coefficient since the data of all nine studies are considered. 0.54 is a large positive correlation and supports the idea that the values of the cognitive complexity metric are a good indicator of how long it takes developers to understand code snippets. And this is already a pretty good result, since time is something we all have too little of. We did such an analysis also for measures of correctness, subjective ratings, physiological variables, and a combination of time and correctness. Our results were highly positive for time, as we have just seen, but also for subjective ratings and the combination of time and correctness. We observed mixed results for correctness and physiological variables, but to a neutral extent. This can have several reasons, and we refer to a discussion on this in our paper. To the evaluation of the physiological variables, we must add that our results are based on the dataset of a single study. This study measured code understanding in an fMRI scanner. The results for correctness also showed a tendency to support the metric, but in the end only a weak correlation was calculated. All in all, the cognitive complexity metric works very well, and we can now claim, for all we know, that it is the first validated metric that can actually measure code understandability. If you calculate the metric on your code, for example by using the static code analysis tool in cube, our recommendation is to keep the metric value as low as possible. Finally, two comments. First, a word to all scientists who feel at home in empirical software engineering. Please publish not only your paper, but also your data. I know that this can be time consuming for so many reasons, but let me tell you that there are people out there who will be grateful to you one day. And nope, providing data on request is not a long-term solution. We asked 12 authors whose study would have been relevant for our purposes whether they could provide us with their data. Only six of them answered us, and only three of them could offer us their data set. Whenever possible, try to make your data available. And last but not least, if you liked this video, you might want to subscribe to backslash science. It's a new YouTube channel where I plan to communicate scientific findings in software engineering in a way that is not only understandable for scientists. I'm super happy about any support. My name is Marvin Wierich. Thanks and see you soon. Thank you, thank you, Marcus. Very nice video. A lot of audience appreciated. Uh, so I, I do have a question. Um, as far as uh, as I know, uh, quality complexity is like MACED complexity. Usually, is calculated at the method level. So how did you calculate it? Which tool did you use? Uh, we used SonarCube for the calculation, and it was um, a bit difficult because uh, a lot of these code snippets that were provided in the supplemental materials of other studies. Uh, were not in a format that were actually compilable. So um, we sometimes had to copy them from the PDF files into source code files and make them compilable or add some import statements and stuff like this. So, but yeah, then then we calculated the cognitive complexity automatically with Sonar Cube on method level. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so there are a few questions from the from the audience, uh, but now I would like to. Show you the question from Simona Motonia. So uh, the code from datasets were in the same programming languages. So, and the second is, did you study the relation between cognitive complexity and object-oriented metrics? Okay, first question. And they were from different languages, and we explicitly report this in our paper. Um, I, I don't explicitly remember, but I, I think most were in Java or C, um, and some, yeah, more. Special languages were also there, but yeah, most most studies uh, share the same language. Um, and the second question: uh, No, we did not uh, do this. Uh, we did not uh, correlate um, uh, cognitive complexity with other object-oriented metrics, but, and also not other metrics with the data set we have. But uh, now we could do this because we uh, published uh, our data and uh, also prepared a readme file that links to all the data sets of the 10 studies that we also used. So 
um, people could take these data now and evaluate uh, other metrics, for example, and see if they measure code understandability. Thank you, thank you. I would really like to see these comparisons, especially between uh, cognitive complexity and cyclomatic mm -hmm. complexity. Okay, thanks a lot. So now I would like to give the stage uh, to the next presenter, uh, Bruno Gois Mateus, uh, that is gonna present a paper on the adoption and usage of evolution of Kotlin feature in Android development. Okay, hello everyone. Well, my name is Bruno Gois Mateus. I'm a PhD student at l'Université Polytechnique Eau de France, and I will present my research on the adoption, usage, and evolution of Kotlin features in Android development, which I developed with my co-author, Matias Martinez. So historically, Android applications have been mostly developed using Java. But in 2017, Google announced Kotlin as an official program language of the Android platform. After that, some studies in the literature reported that around 11% of Android applications have adopted Kotlin. In more recently, in 2019, Google announced that Android development would become increasingly Kotlin first, which means that new APIs and features will be offered first in Kotlin and later in Java. And we believe that this fact will boost the use of Kotlin to write mobile applications. Kotlin is a program language that provides a different approach to write applications. It is fully interoperable with Java because it runs on the top of the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine, and it combines object-oriented features and functional features. Some of them are not present in Java or not available for Android developers. To give an idea about which kind of features you are talking about, let's see some examples. So in this first example, in the Kotlin code, we have two different Kotlin features, type inference, and safe call. Due to the type inference, we don't need to declare the type of the variable result. It will depend on the execution of the next statement. Because of the safe call, method two will be executed only if the new label var is new. Otherwise, the method one will be the one executed. And depending on this execution, the type of result will be inferred. In the snippet below, we see the Java version of the same logic using Java option. However, Java option are not available for all Android devices. To use Java option, you need to use uh, the Android API 24 or higher. Here we have another example of Kotlin feature, string templates. Using string templates, you can embed Kotlin expression inside strings and then later they will be evaluated and their, their value will be automatic, automatically substituted inside the string. To do something like this in Java, as you can see in the snippet below, you have to use a lot of concatenations. Therefore, we believe that Kotlin features bring new opportunities or new ways of writing applications. But to the best of our knowledge, there is no study in the literature about the adoption of Kotlin by Android developers. Because of that, in our research, we, focus, we answer three research questions about the usage of Kotlin features by Android developers. Research question one, which Kotlin features are adopted by Android developers? Research question two, when do Android developers introduce Kotlin features during applications evolution? And research question three, how the usage of Kotlin features evolve along with the evolution of Android applications? To answer the research question one, first, we focus only in features, Kotlin features not present in Java or not available for Android developers. So to identify those features, we navigated through the Kotlin official documentation and the Kotlin release notes. Then we built a tool that operates at the level of the abstract syntax tree. And we coded analyzers to detect 26 features. Using our tool, we evaluated applications from Pharmazua, the largest publicly available data set of open source applications written in Kotlin. In total, we analyzed 387 applications 
written fully or partially in Kotlin. And we found that Android developers use all the studied features, as we can see here in this plot. Also, seven features are used in at least 80% of applications. And the most used features are type inference, lambda, and safe call. Regarding the, se the second research question, for each application, we identify the commit that first introduced Kotlin. Then for each feature, we identify the first commit that introduced a given feature. And then we counted the number of days between the introduction of Kotlin and the introduction of a given feature. And we found that in the following 10 days after the first commit with Kotlin code, 15 out 26 features are added into Android applications, as you can see here in the plot. And also, we found that the most used Kotlin features tend to be introduced in the first commit with Kotlin code. In the third research question, we investigate some possible scenarios of evolution trends usage. For instance, if a given feature always increases its number of instances along with the application evolution, or if a given feature tends to be introduced only once or few times, and then it gets stable. Or in another example, if a given feature do not present a clear trend, for instance, varying between addition, addition or removal of instance. To determine the evolution trend that dominates each feature, we calculated the series of the number of instances per application. For each commit, we counted the number of instances of each feature. Then we plot the, the plots, and after analyzing those plots, we established 11 major evolution trends that we can see here in the plots. To automatically classify the evolution trend of a feature, we mapped these trends to five mathematical formulas. Linear, that we use to classify three trends, constant rise, constant decline, and stability. Exponential, that we use to classify two features. Logarithmic, that we use to classify one trend. Sigmoid, that we use, sigmoid form, that we use to classify four trends. And polynomial, that we use to identify one trend. We use the SciPy library to fit our formula with the series. And using nonlinear least square error, we choose the formula that yields less error to predict the values. And we found that the values tend to add more instances along the evolution of applications of 24 out of 26 features studied. And also we found that the most common trends that better describe 24 features are constant rise, where the number of instances always increase along the evolution in a constant rate. rate. Plateau gradual rise, where it starts with a period of stability, and then in a sequence of consecutive commits, we note an increase of the number of instances, but then after these commits, it gets stable again. And plateau sudden rise, which is similar to the previous one, but here the main difference is the increase of instance happens exactly in two consecutive commits. Finally, we conclude that Android developers are exploring all Kotlin features, including the experimental ones, as Coroutine, that was experimented until November of 2019, and Contract, that is a still experimental feature, but we could find instance of them in our data set. Also, we conclude that the most used features are added at the same time that Kotlin is introduced into applications, and that the, along with the evolution of applications, the number of instances of Kotlin features increase. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, I'm here to answer. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation, uh, Mateus. 
So uh, one question, which are the practical impl implications for practitioners uh, of these results? Uh, okay, we determined the paper 10 implications, and of course it depends on uh, some features. For instance, we found a lot of use of, how can I say, unsafe calls that the cotton has an operator that you say to the language, okay, I'm sure that this is not new, but at the same time, it opens an opportunity to give a new point exception that the type, the type C thing of code tries to, to, to avoid. So for each feature, for each result, we, we detailed some implications, but it depends. For there are a lot of features that, features that are used a lot like lambdas. So maybe there is some, a new code smell happen that we don't know because mm -hmm. there are not of nested lambdas. So we have more details about this result in the paper. Yeah, but what is the most important message you would like to give to the practitioners? Uh, okay, uh, I would say that Kotlin brings a lot of new features and we don't have uh, results about this uh, in the literature. So I, I believe that new code smells, you have to take or new features have to be, have to be studied to find if they are using in a correct way, because there is nothing in the literature, and even in the, in the how can I say, in the market, say, okay, this is not a good practice in Kotlin. This is a bad practice. This is a code smell. We have just a few base code smells that came from object oriented features. And with the new features, maybe there are more code smells, more opportunities of research. In that. Okay. Uh, we have one question from YouTube from Peter Lupo. He asks, um, I've noticed a trend of using Kotlin in tests, even in Java projects. Were you able to assess if the usage of Kotlin was localized to the test or in the app itself? Okay, let, let me see here. Yes. Okay, got it. Actually, uh, in this, uh, in our, Instead, we analyze it, caught and code in the whole application. So we have several different applications, but we have a lot of applications completely written in Kotlin. So I would say that it's not only use it to in test, but I can see the point because even Google they they suggest you to start migrating gradually, and probably people are trying to first migrate some tests and then the code itself. But uh, the vast majority of our data set contains applications that are written fully in Kotlin. So tests and the, the normal code, let's say. Hey, thank you. I guess uh, we do not have any other comments. Uh, I think we can move uh, to the next, uh, if there are no other comments, I think we can move to the next session in uh, 15 minutes. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thanks, everyone, and uh, see you in a quarter of hour.